the Lord. Well, let's take our Bibles and turn to Colossians chapter 3 and verse 16. I want to begin a two-part sermon this morning called Join the Song. If you're with us, we're in the middle of a series called Total Grace. And we've been looking at the, the gem of God's grace and the different facets to God's gracious work in each of our lives. And we've looked at saving grace in Ephesians 2. We've looked at strengthening grace in Hebrews 4. We've looked at serving grace in uh, Romans 12. We've looked at speaking grace in Colossians 4. And this morning we're going to begin to look at singing grace. God gives us grace to sing. We sing of grace because of grace. And so uh, let's stand in honor of God's Word. I'm going to break in at verse 12, give you the context of verse 16. But we're looking at Colossians 3 verse 16, where Paul tells us to sing with grace in our hearts to the Lord. Colossians 3.12, Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, bearing with one another, and forgiving one another. If anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you also must do. But above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which also you were called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. You may be seated. I want to begin this morning by presenting you with a spiritual truism. Here's what it is. When someone finds Christ, they along with Christ find their voice. When someone finds Christ, they along with Christ find their voice. They automatically become a loud mouth for the gospel. You can see that at salvation. At, at, at salvation, they find their voice because Romans 10 verse 9 tells us that we're not only to believe with our hearts, we're to confess with our mouths that Jesus is Lord. So at salvation, they find their voice in confession, and after salvation, they find their voice in celebration. As they come to understand the magnitude of God's mercy, the breadth and depth of God's work in their life, the promise of heaven, that, that Christian begins to worship God and, and praise God. At salvation, they find their voice in confession, but after salvation, they find their voice in celebration, in worship, and in praise. In Psalm 118 verse 14 says, the Lord is my strength and my song, and he has become my salvation. Anyone that has experienced salvation will sing, will worship, will praise. When a man or a woman experiences the grace of God, they not only want to talk about it, they want to sing about it. Doesn't David tell us that in Psalm 40 verse 3? Having spoken about how God redeemed his life, he says that God has put a new song in my mouth, even praise unto our God. Listen, I want you to think about this. God is too great. His love is too wonderful. And his grace is too amazing for you and I simply to talk about it. Now, we love to talk about it. We love to share the gospel. We love to tell people our testimony of God's saving grace and God's keeping power. But we also realize talking about it is not enough. We want to sing about it. We want to worship God. We want to extol His love and His mercy and His grace. That's why wherever you find Christians, you'll find singing. Read church history. And you'll realize in the early Methodist movement, you could tell a Methodist home in the community because singing was heard from it. 
Wherever you find Christians, you'll find singing. Because according to the psalm, Psalm 34, verse 3, let us exalt his name together. It's natural that we move from experiencing God's salvation to expressing our love for him in song. Because as C.S. Lewis says, we we tend to um, praise that which we enjoy. If you read C.S. Lewis in his book, Reflections on the Psalms, he says something very profound. I think we delight to praise what we enjoy because the praise not only merely expresses but completes the enjoyment. It's his appointed consummation. When you enjoy something so much, you tend to praise it. You tend to move from just talking about it to praising it. In fact, he goes on to kind of explain his thought. The world rings with praise. Lovers praise their mistresses. Readers their favorite poet. Walkers praise the countryside. Players praise their favorite game. Praise of weather, wines, actors, motors, horses, colleges, countries, historical personages, children, flowers, mountains, rare stamps, rare beetles, even sometimes politicians or scholars. Except where intolerably adverse circumstances interfere, praise almost seems to be inner health made audible. I had not noticed either that just as men spontaneously praise whatever they value, they spontaneously urge us to join them in praising it. Isn't she lovely? Wasn't it glorious? Don't you think that's magnificent? The psalmists, in telling everyone to praise God, are doing what all men do when they speak of that which they care about. C.S. Lewis is helping us understand the phenomena of Christian worship, praise, and singing. And you understand that by understanding that when our eyes are open to the beauty of God's character, to the everlasting nature of God's love, to the price attached to it in the sending of His Son, when we see how amazing His grace is, how wonderful His love is, It's only natural that we will praise that which we enjoy. And not only that, we'll ask others to come along for the ride. Come, let us exalt his name together. So what's my point by way of introduction? It's pretty simple. When you find Christ, you find your voice. When you become a Christian, you become a loud mouth for the gospel. You like to talk about it, but you didn't realize talking about it's not enough. You like to sing about it. Now, admittedly, let's get this out of the way. We're all meant to sing. That's what God has called us to do. But some of us are good out of it, and some of us are not so good at it. As I heard my pastor say once back in Northern Ireland, when it comes to a congregation, there are nightingales and there are gales in the night. And given that reality, here's what I would suggest. We've all got to sing, every single one of us, in tune, out of tune. We've all got to sing, but given the fact that some of us are out of tune rather than in tune, some of us only should sing with a microphone, amen? In fact, uh, Gary Peterson, one of our men who's involved in our prison ministry, told me a story one day. He was over in Chino Hills sharing the gospel with some of the inmates. And during the service, he was up front in front of the microphone and the stand. And he got into a kind of zone. And as they were singing, he had his eyes closed, his hands up. And after he had finished kind of that moment, he opened his eyes and the microphone was 10 feet away. (laughs) Some prisoner had got up and actually moved the thing 10 feet away. Now, you you could conclude that that's a prank. I think it was, Gary, sing, but don't sing with a microphone. Because only some of us can sing with a microphone. But we've all got to sing. He has put a new song in our mouths, even praise unto our God. God is our strength, and God is our song, and God has become our salvation. So, I want to help you and, and, and me sing better, if not sweeter, And so I want to turn to Colossians chapter 3 and verse 16, which we're going to look at this morning and next Sunday morning. 
I want to want you to see this text we're about to look at. I'll read it here. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your heart to the Lord. I want you to understand that what we have in this simple verse is a rare window, a rare peek into the worship experience of the New Testament church. What we have here is a worship update on how those early believers worshiped God. Now, for the purpose of our series, I want you to see that here we have singing grace. We have set out to understand that grace not only meets us at the beginning of our Christian life, it's there in the middle, and it will be there at the end, and we'll experience more of it beyond the end. It's all grace. It's total grace. There's saving grace, Ephesians 2, 1 to 10. There's strengthening grace, Hebrews 4. There's speaking grace, Colossians 4. There's serving grace, Romans 12. And here you have singing grace. When the grace of God touches a man's life, when the grace of God transforms a woman's heart, singing is the result. The Christian is a person who sings with grace in their heart. Now, you may have a translation, actually, that renders that singing with thanks in your heart to the Lord. But I think the New King James here has, a, has got it right, because although it's not to be seen in our English version, in the Greek text, there's a definite article associated with the word kairos or grace. So Paul is saying, sing with the grace <laughs> that's in your hearts to the Lord. Grace is the context out of which our praise ascends to God. Our inner experience of grace manifests itself in song. We sing of grace because of grace. We delight in the grace of God and songs bubble to the surface of our hearts. Now, before we look at the text, let's put it quickly in its context. That's why I read from verse 12 to 17, because in this section of Paul's letter to the Colossians, he's dealing with the conduct of the new man in Christ. Because if any man's in Christ, he's a new creature. Trust in Christ leads to transformation in Christ. And what you have in this passage, in fact, beginning at the early parts of chapter 3 is a contrast between the old life before we became a Christian and the new life now that we are a Christian and the changes that should happen in the life of those who have embraced the gospel. Uh, you, you can see in verse 6 that he talks about their life prior to their coming to Jesus Christ when indeed they were sons of disobedience and, and they walked and conducted themselves after fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, covetousness, and idolatry. But notice verse 8, but now you yourselves are to put off all these, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy language out of your mouth. Do not lie to one another. Verse 10, and put on the new man who is renewed in knowledge according to the image of him who created him. When you and I put our faith in Jesus Christ, we're given a new nature. We're given new affections. God reorients our lives where we begin to pursue righteousness and follow Jesus Christ. And we put off that old behavior, and we put on this new behavior, not in, not, not in self-will, but by the Spirit of God. Look at verse 12, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies. Paul takes the image of someone changing their clothes. You can imagine a man coming in from a factory where he's got worked among dirt and grime, and his, his clothes are, are filthy. We've got images perhaps of the, the old days and the coal miners coming home and they put off that, that dirty you know, overall and they got charred and put on some clean clothes. And Paul's kind of taking that image and he's saying, you know what, you, you put off that, 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 that 
dirty behavior, that, that, that behavior that indeed um, was against God's will and God's Word. And now that you're a Christian, with the help of the Holy Spirit and through the instruction of God's Word, here's the kind of behavior you need to put on. This is the before and after pictures of the Christian life. I had an old pastor back in Northern Ireland who used to say, if there's no change, there's something strange. If someone tells you they're a follower of Jesus Christ, but they go on living in sexual sin, they go on behaving in a manner outside the will of God, they go on deliberately disobeying the, 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 the law of God and the teachings of Jesus Christ, they're not a Christian. Because Christians put off vice and they put on virtue. Not perfectly, but progressively and permanently. And so that's where we're at in the text. See, Christ forgives people, but he fixes people. He forgives you your sin, and then he starts to give you an ability through the Spirit of God not to repeat that sin. He not only forgives, he fixes. And so alongside these virtues of compassion, kindness, humility, meekness, patience, forgiveness, and love, Paul then says in verse 15, put on or let the peace of God umpire your hearts. And alongside that, our text, let the word of Christ dwell in your hearts richly. And as the word of Christ dwells in a Christian's heart richly, it produces in them a song where they sing to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in their hearts to the Lord. Psalm 119 verse 54 says, Your statutes have become my song. See, as you and I study the Bible, and the Word of God does its work in our lives, it produces worship. We move from the Word to worship that's where we're at in our text. So let's come and look at the text. Three things, just one this morning and two next Sunday morning. If you're looking in the outline, we're going to see in this text regarding the grace of singing or singing with grace. We're going to see singing and the scriptures. We're going to see singing and the saints. And we're going to see singing and the Savior. But here's the first part, singing and the scriptures. There's a correlation between us singing and worshiping God and an intake of God's Word. Your statutes have become my song. Look at the text. Let the Word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another. Let's look at this phrase, the Word of Christ. Now, in its narrow and historic interpretation, we may want to limit this to the writings of the apostles in the Gospels, where they write down and record the things that Jesus said and did. Jesus told them, didn't he, in the upper room discourse, John 14, 26 and John 16, verse 13, that the Spirit of God would help them write down an accurate record of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. That's a, that's a narrow interpretation. I think there's a, a broader interpretation that doesn't do injustice to that thought, but just widens it and broadens it. And it's the idea that this phrase, the Word of Christ, embraces the whole of the Bible. The whole of the Bible. I like what Derek Tidball says in his commentary on Colossians. He says this, the Word of Christ refers to the teaching of Christ, which we have recorded for us in the Gospels. But a full understanding of the teaching of Christ can only be obtained by reading the Gospels in the context of the Old Testament, which leads up to them, and the rest of the New Testament, which leads away from them. In other words, this is shorthand for speaking about the whole of the Bible with a special emphasis on the words of Jesus living in us. See, the Old Testament leads up to the Gospels and the book of Acts and the epistles and the Revelation, they flow out of the Gospels. So I think when we read here about the Word of Christ, we're dealing with the whole of the Bible in relation to the message of God's love in Jesus Christ. I've said it before, in the Old Testament, He is coming. In the Gospels and in Acts, He has come. In the epistles, in Jude, and in the Revelation, he's coming again. The Bible is a hymn book. 
It's an H-I-M book. It's about him. In fact, didn't Jesus reiterate this on the road to Emmaus when a couple of his disciples are at, are, are, are at a loss to understand the seeming loss of Jesus Christ by death on a cross? And Jesus comes to them. He opens their eyes. He talks with them along that road. And he helps them understand that this needed to happen. And in Luke 24, 25 to 27, you've got those well-worn and well-known words. And beginning at Moses, that's the Pentateuch, and the Psalms and the prophets, he spoke of those things concerning himself and how he needed to suffer. In John 5, 39... He talks about the scriptures and how they speak of him. When, when Paul writes to young Timothy in 2 Timothy 3 verse 15, he, he talks about how he has known the scriptures from he was a child, which has been able to make him wise unto salvation through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. The Old Testament is the scriptures Timothy heard. And those Old Testament scriptures had the gospel in them. So the word of Christ here, in a, in a narrow sense, speaks of the words of Christ recorded in Scripture. But I think in a broader sense, it's the whole of the Bible. The Old Testament leads up to the Gospels, and then um, the epistles and the Revelation come out of the Gospels. Let's look at this other phrase, dwell in you richly, as we're just trying to get our heads and hands around the text. Let the Word of Christ, let the Word of God, let the Bible, let the Scriptures dwell in you richly in all wisdom. Literally, let the Word of God take up residence in your life. This word dwell is a domestic word. It means to make a home, to settle down. And so this is what we're being told here. Let the Word of God, through the preaching of that text, take residence in your heart. May, may the Scriptures find a ready-made home in your heart. It speaks about the fact that a Christian is someone who's always hospitable to the Word. Meet a Christian, and you'll meet a person who wants the Bible, who wants to sit under preaching, who wants to sit down themselves and study it for themselves, who likes to be in a group of Christians discussing the text of Scripture. Because a Christian is someone whose heart is hospitable to the Word of God preached and taught. That's what is being taught here. In fact, that, that, that's echoed, isn't it, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, in, in verse 5, in 1 Thessalonians 2, verse 13, as Paul describes how the gospel took root in the city of Thessalonica in Greece, he says this in verse 5, For our gospel did not come to you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and in much assurance, as you know what kind of men we were among you for your sake. Listen, and you became followers of us and the Lord, having received the word in much affliction. In fact, he pays them a great compliment down in chapter 2 and verse 13. For this reason, we also thank God without ceasing, because when you received the Word of God, which you heard from us, you welcomed it. Not as the Word of man, but as it is in truth the Word of God, which also effectively works in you who believe. And again, this is a description of, of a New Testament Christian. The New Testament Christian, the follower of Jesus Christ, is a man or a woman who welcomes the opportunity to hear the word and then welcomes the word heard. That, that word welcome is the same kind of word, not the same word, but the same kind of word that we have in Colossians 3 verse 16. It speaks about welcoming somebody, somebody warmly into your home. And when you're excited about someone coming to your home, either a friend or a family member, you, you know they're coming. When the bell rings or the door is wrapped, you open it, and what do you, you normally say, come on in. We've been, we've been waiting for you. We've been looking forward to this. The, the kettle's on. Uh, sit down. Come on, on in. That's our word. Paul is saying, you know what I give thanks to God for? 
This, this cost you. you. You received this in much affliction. But when you heard the word of God, you welcomed it. You said to God's word, come on, come on, come on in to my life. Sit down, teach me, and transform me. That's what's going on in this text. Now, I want to turn the text in a particular direction because I want you to, I want you to understand that we, we, we're probably hearing this text as an individual. And, and right now, you and I are thinking about our, a chair somewhere in our home, a little cubby hole maybe where we get alone with the Lord, with our Bible open, and we're pouring over the Scriptures, and we're allowing it to speak to God, and it's prompting us. We're allowing it to speak to us, and it's prompting us to speak to God. That's the image, personal devotions, and that's a good thing. But that's not primarily in Paul's mind, because the word you here is in the plural. Let the Word of Christ dwell in you all, if you were from Alabama, or Usins, if you're in Northern Ireland. <laughs> Let the Word of Christ dwell in you all richly. He's speaking to a congregation. And you know what? I think you can tell that by looking at the text again. Let the Word of Christ dwell in you, plural, richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing. Notice one another. There's something collective and corporate going on here, something congregational that's happening in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your, plural, your hearts to the Lord. So I want you to understand that right now this text is being addressed to a congregation of people. The picture here is not personal devotion. It is not your quiet time. The picture here is corporate worship in the church on the Lord's Day with the assembly of the saints. We're, according to Ephesians 4, in the best of circumstances, among that congregation will stand men gifted to the church by the risen Christ who are gifted to teach, able to teach. Men who labor in the word and doctrine. And the church assembles to hear those men and to let that word dwell, take resonance in their hearts. So what we have here is let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. This is a message to listen intently and receive personally and live out practically what you hear from gifted teachers in the church. In fact, this tax justifies what we're doing right now. This justifies the kind of service that we have here at Kindred, where we sing, we pray, we fellowship, and we hear the Word of God. It's as simple as that. It's unvarnished, although beautiful. Because preaching dominated the New Testament worship service. I'm convinced of that. I want to convince you of that. Look, look at a few texts. I mean, we have in the book of Acts a kind of record of how the early church, you know, congregated and rolled. In Acts chapter 2 and in verse 41 and 42, we read of what happened to those who received the word and were baptized, the 3,000 souls that were added to the church? What did they do? Did they all scatter into their own little corner? No, it says, and they corporately together continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. That's the preaching of apostolic doctrine because in the text before, they, Peter had exhorted them and testified to them in many words and they received the word. And the people who received the word wanted more of the word. They wanted to welcome it more into their lives. And so they got together and they continued and devoted themselves to the apostles' doctrine, to fellowship, the breaking of bread, and prayers. It's a typical month at Kindred where we come together, we break bread, we fellowship, we pray, and we devote ourselves to the apostles' doctrine as the word is proclaimed. Remember that incident in Acts chapter 6 where you have, um, uh, you know, the church is kind of uh, being overrun. It's trying to catch up with the needs that need to be met. 
The widow's fund here has been poorly administered, and the apostles are being drawn into a growing controversy, and, and, and they say, look, it's not desirable that we should leave the Word of God and serve tables. It's not that that's beneath us, since um, we follow the one who washed people's feet. It's not that that's beneath us. It's, not that's, it's just that's not the best use of my ta- our time or our talent. So here's what we're going to do. You guys, you know, get yourself seven men of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, and appoint them over this business. But notice verse 4, but we ourselves will give ourselves continually to prayer on the ministry of the Word. Read the New Testament. Push open the door into a New Testament service, and at the heart of it is the ministry of the Word, a devotion to apostolic doctrine a hearing of the Scriptures. In fact, in chapter 6, verse 7, you have one of several summary statements as Luke tells you what was the the catalytic uh, um, factor in the growth of the church. And we read in verse 7, then the Word of God spread and the number of disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem. It was the Word of God proclaimed that produced disciples. One other text would be um, Acts chapter 10, verse 33. Acts chapter 10, verse 33. I love it. It's the conversion of Cornelius, the Greek. And there are some in his household that come to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, and they asked Peter to come because they want to hear more. And in Acts 10, verse 33, so I sent to you, That's Cornelius speaking of Peter. So I sent you immediately, and you have done well to come. Now, therefore, we are all present before God to hear all the things commanded you by God. Love that. We're all here, Peter. They start speaking. Start teaching what God has commanded. And, And that's just a sample. Read it for yourself. It'll appear everywhere. When you go looking for it, you'll find it. The ministry of the Word defined and directed the life of the church. Can, can I add another argument on top of that? I mean, when, when you read something like First and Second Timothy and Titus, which are pastoral manuals for young leaders in the early church, you're going to see an emphasis on preaching as their primary calling and role. The pastoral office is primarily a teaching office. What did Jesus say to Peter? Feed my sheep. And when Paul's talking to Timothy, he describes the Christian leader in 1 Timothy 3, 1 to 6. And the emphasis is on the character of the man. And there's only one emphasis on his ability and his giftedness, but I want you to see what the emphasis is. In 1 Timothy 3, verse 2, that man who's going to have oversight of God's people must be able to teach. Because the early church service was a teaching service. What do we read in 1 Timothy 4, verse 13? Timothy, give yourself to the public reading of Scripture. And alongside that would come an exposition. And by the way, that's a throwback to synagogue worship. I mean, look at the, the book, look at the, uh, the Gospels and look at the book of Acts. Jesus goes into the synagogue in Luke 4, and he opens up the ta- scroll of Isaiah. He reads it, and then he explains that he's the fulfillment of it. Because The reading of the law and the exposition of the law was part of the synagogue worship service. In in Acts um, 9 verse 20, you'll read this interesting text about Paul and what he does in synagogues. Immediately he preached Christ in the synagogues, plural, that he is the Son of God. Paul was given an opportunity to preach in the synagogues because in synagogues, The Word of God was preached. See Him in a Christian service. That's why we see that in the book of Acts. That's why when you read about the pastoral office, you see this emphasis on teaching. 1 Timothy 5 verse 17. Those who labor in the Word and doctrine are worthy of double honor. When Paul is signing off, saying goodbye in his second letter to Timothy, 2 Timothy 4 verses 1 to 5, preach the Word. I'm just trying to justify what we do. I'm just trying to have you understand that 
this church is like most Protestant churches where the pulpit is central, that this, this is here central because it's conveying a message. The ministry of the Word is central. The Word leads to worship. It is the Word that informs us about God. It's the Word of Christ that teaches us the gospel. As we come to understand it and experience it and enjoy it, we want to praise that which we enjoy, which starts with being informed through the Scriptures. But the Word leads to worship. Preaching leads to praise. And Scripture leads to song. Amen? That's what we're arguing here. Preaching and teaching God's Word was not an intrusion into the worship service of the early church, but rather an indispensable part of it. Is there not something wrong with us today? Are we not putting ourselves into reverse gear when in evangelical church after evangelical church, we are removing the pulpit, we are shortening the sermon? What is going on with us? Let the Word dwell in you, the congregation, richly in wisdom. And in having heard it, teach one another and admonish one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. In the New Testament, the worship of God was always a response to the Word of God. In the New Testament, worship was a pulpit-driven experience. Worship was more about opening your ears than it was about closing your eyes and raising your hands. Singing is an echoing of Scripture. Preaching was not only a crucial part of worship, it created more worship. I like what Spurgeon says here. There is no worship of God that is better than the hearing of a sermon. I venture to say that if a sermon be well heard, it puts faith in exercise as you believe it. It puts love in exercise as you enjoy it. It puts gratitude in exercise as you think of all the blessings that God has given you. If the sermon be what it should be, it stirs all the coals of fire in your spirit and makes them burn with a brighter flame. That's why our Protestant forefathers and our evangelical forebrothers believed that when the, you came to that point where the Word of God was preached, you'd come to the high point of the worship service. In fact, if we, if we have done anything wrong, perhaps we should preach first and sing later because it's the Word of Christ dwelling in us richly that produces these songs where we sing about God's grace in our hearts to the Lord. I like also what David Garland says, and we need to hear it in the melee of worship wars and the compromise that's going on in our churches today. The worship of the early Christians placed a premium on the spoken word in contrast to perfunctory rituals or mysterious ceremonies. The New Testament service was simple, unvarnished, It didn't require cathedrals. It didn't require candles. It didn't require vestments and robes. It didn't require lights to be dimmed and atmospheres to be created. It needed a man filled by the Spirit of God, an appointed leader among the people of God, standing among them, declaring the Word of God. And as they listened and responded and allowed the Word of Christ to dwell in them richly, discipleship took place, worship ascended to God, and the gospel spread. But for the time that remains, let's go on a practical direction just for a few moments. Because if the Word of Christ is to dwell in the congregation richly, in the body of believers richly, expository preaching must be married to expository listening. Communication is a package deal. It requires, on the one hand, a good speaker who's compelling and cogent, and clear, and biblical, and textually true. But it also requires, on the other hand, a keen listener who has come ready like the Bereans to hear and study the Scriptures for themselves. Not simply to be spoon-fed, but to meditate on the Scriptures themselves. Communication is a package deal. The parishioner 
must be in partnership with the preacher in working hard at listening and learning. There must be a partnership between the pulpit and the pew. I recommended it before. I recommend it again. It's a book called Expository Listening by Ken Ramey. Buy it. You'll be the better for it, and you'll make my job easier. <laughs> Here's what he says in this book, Expository Listening. In order for you to receive the maximum benefit from the sermon you hear, you must partner with the preacher so that the Word of God accomplishes its intended purpose of transforming your life. Nothing creates a more explosive, electrifying, life-changing atmosphere than when the lightning bolts from a spirit-impart preacher hit the lightning rods of a spirit-illuminated listener. Oh, I like that. When the lightning bolts of a spirit-filled preacher are met with the lightning rods of a spirit-illuminated listener. That's when God shows up. That's when the Spirit of God is felt. That's when a move of God begins. He goes on, There is no telling the dynamic impact the Spirit of God will make through the Word of God anytime someone faithfully explains and applies God's Word, coming in contact with someone who faithfully listens and obeys it. So I wrote down a few little things. Just going to go through these a bit like a bit of a checklist. To, to just kind of stir your thinking, and then we'll pick this up next week. We've looked at singing on the Scriptures. We'll look at singing on the saints and singing on the Savior. But what about lessons in expository listening? If you want to be a good expository listener, I think several things are, in, are involved. Number one, prizing. If you're taking notes, prizing. I think it all begins with how you view the Bible and how you value the Bible. If I'm going to get up and open it, I'm going to spend 45 or 50 minutes teaching it. If you don't value it, it'll come to nothing. But if you sit with an understanding of the value of the Word of God, the treasure that it is, the heart and mind of God revealed to His creation, a telescope on the future, the good news of Jesus Christ, it will help us Make our decisions by instructing us in righteousness. If you, if you under, understand all of that, you're going to be all ears. You're going to be all in. So it begins with prizing, doesn't the psalmist say in Psalm 19, verse 10, that, that the Word of God is to be desired more than gold? That's the value he put on it. Job says, I esteemed your word more than my necessary food. If you go to Psalm 119 and, and verse... Um, 162, uh, you're going to read th these words, Psalm 119, 162. Very interesting picture. I rejoiced at your word as one who finds great treasure. The word of God is like gold. <laughs> That's kind of, you know, this book is gold. You know, we often say that he's gold or she's gold. This book is gold. And when you and I discover some precious promise, some, some, some hope or expectation for the future, some view of the beauty of the Lord Jesus Christ in person and work, it's like we've just discovered treasure. In fact, um, I think it was Warren Wearsby brings this out in commenting on Psalm 119, 101 verses 162. He says this, In Bible days, people sometimes hid their wealth in jars and buried it in the ground. And if a farmer plowing his field suddenly discovered a jar filled with buried gold, he would greatly rejoice. And there are great treasures buried in God's Word, and you and I must diligently dig for them as we read, meditate, and pray. And when we find these treasures, we should rejoice and give thanks, Christ being the greatest treasure. Do you prize the Word of God? Do you prize the preaching of the Word of God? Do you realize it's a sacred hour when we sit down together? And, and we put the week behind us and we, we hold off thoughts on the week to come and the Word of God is opened and God speaks into our lives. It's the high point of the week. What, what about Nehemiah 8 verses um, 5 and 6 where you have that moment where at the, at the water gate um, the Word of God is preached and, and the Word of God is read and, and there we read and the people bowed down and worshipped. 
It's, it was just a, a sacred moment, a, a wonderful time when the Word of God was opened and the people realized this is something special. Not only prizing, number uh, two, preparing. Preparing. I love Ezra ten, 7, verse 10. And Ezra prepared or set his heart to study the law. He set or he prepared his heart to study the law. I'm not sure what that all involved, but for you and I, it involves, you know, preparing our, our bodies and our minds with a good night's sleep. It means preparing our hearts by sitting down before the Word of God ourselves in a quiet moment, asking God to use the service in our lives in a, an effective manner. It, it means um, prioritizing the Lord's day preparing our week so that nothing gets in the way of assembling with God's people to hear the word of Christ preached that it might dwell in your heart richly. I like Revelation 1 verse 10 where we read of John. I know it's got a special implication, but a secondary application. John was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and he heard a voice. Are you in the Spirit? You may be in your car on your way to church on the Lord's day, but are you in the Spirit, in the car, coming to church? Ready, eager, prayed up, prepared, prizing, preparing, purging. You want to be a good expository listener? Then, then get rid of those things in your life or in your thinking that get in the way of God's Word. What about... James 1, verse 21. James 1, verse 21. Therefore, lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. He's speaking to believers. This is sanctification. The saving of their souls is the continual saving that comes after justification. And, and that's going to require the receiving of the Word of God. And to receive it, you've got to lay aside those things that get in the way of the Spirit's work through the Word. Interesting, the word filthiness here is a Greek word that can carry the idea of earwax. And I will not get into that deeply. But that's the idea. Sins can be like earwax. Wrong attitudes. Wrong behavior. Watching the wrong thing on a Saturday night before the Lord's day. Doing a wrong thing. It's filthiness. It's like earwax. It's going to get in the way of you hearing the Word of God through the Spirit of God. And you've got to repent of that. You've got to purge that. You've got to lay that aside. You've got to be at, at that place where your heart is open and your motives are sincere to what God wants to do in your life. That's why you... you, you need to be thinking through like the psalmist in Psalm 139, Lord, search my heart, examine my way, see if there's any wicked way in me. Pondering, prizing, preparing, purging, pondering. We, we've, we've not only got to hear, but we've got to hear by meditation, by, by pondering, by thinking through what we hear. What does is, what is the psalmist say in Psalm 119, verses 15 and 16? I will meditate on your precepts and contemplate your ways. I will delight myself in your statutes. I will not forget your word. I mean, some of us have forgot it by about 125 this afternoon. For me, it might be about 4 o'clock, but for you, it's 125. You know what, what it's saying. It's so easy to hear but forget. To receive it, like a child receives instruction from a father or a mother and then just throws it away. Shrug of the shoulder. No. No, you're going to ponder it. You're going to contemplate God's way. You love your father, so you receive your instruction. And your father is a king, and you sit under the, the authority of his word, and you meditate on his counsel. It's repeated again because I want to read it. Psalm 119, 93. I will never forget your precepts, for by them you have given me life. 97. Oh, how I love your law. It is my meditation day and night. 
Now, you hear the sermon for an hour, but you can meditate on it the rest of the week. And you can get a top-up at a small group during the week or a men's study or a women's study. And you've got the Word of God, and you meditate on it. You, you, you ponder it. You, you roll it over in your mind. You chew on it like a hard candy. You roll it over, that you roll over your tongue again and again and again. You suck that thing for all it's worth. That's what you do with the Word of God. When I was a young Christian, I used to take little cards, index cards, and I worked at an assembly line in an aircraft company, and I'd take one of those in every day and put it in my overall pocket, and every 30 or 40 minutes, I'd bring it out and let the Word of God wash me in the midst of the filth I was hearing and seeing. Pornographic pictures on the walls, guys' lockers, the filthy language that was going on. I needed the Word of God to keep cleansing me. I needed to meditate on it day and night pondering it, meditating on it. You know, the Word of God is useful for four things. I know time's gone. Let me just squeeze this in. For doctrine, reproof, correction, and instruction in righteousness. Therefore, as you mull over Scripture, ask yourself, what did I learn doctrine? Where have I failed reproof? How can I fix it correction? How can I make this change stick instruction in righteousness? Prizing, preparing, purging, pondering. There's two others. I'm just going to throw them your way. Praying and presenting. Praying. Pray for the preacher that will be true to the text, filled by the Spirit, able to communicate God's Word clearly and confidently. Isn't that what Paul prays for the Colossians to pray for in Colossians 4, 3 to 4? And then pray for yourself that God will give you the grace to receive it and do the hard work of obeying it. Psalm 119, verses 17 to 18. Open my eyes that I may behold wondrous things from out of your law. And then there's a presenting. That's a presenting of yourself. That's an arriving at the text and the sermon with this attitude, whatever I hear, I'm going to obey. If it rebukes me, I'm going to embrace it. If it corrects me, I'm going to take it. And whatever change it points out, I'm going to do it. That's back to Acts 10, verse 33, where Cornelius says to Peter, we're all here. Now speak to us what God has commanded. It's like they turned up on the, on the parade ground as soldiers standing to attention, ready to receive the commandments of the commanding officer. That's what we do on a Sunday morning. Finish with this. There's a story of um, three friends, a, a lawyer and a, a, and a doctor and a pastor who are out deer hunting. And as they go through the woods, a large buck springs out from behind the foliage. For a moment, they're startled, they freeze, but all together, they raise their weapons and fire simultaneously, and the buck drops to the ground. And then a heated debate ensues as to who shot the buck, who can claim the prize. And in the middle of this heated debate, a, a warden, a, a game warden arrives and asks them what the commotion's about, and, and the lawyer tells them, well, you know what, this, this buck just jumped out in front of us, kind of caught us by surprise. For a moment we were startled, but then we all raised our weapons. We shot at the same time, and we're not sure who killed it. And he says, let me examine the buck, and I'll, I'll try and help. And after a few moments, he turns to them, and he said, I'm, I'm pretty sure the, the preacher shot the buck. The lawyer says, what makes you think that? He says, well, it's pretty easy. The bullet went in one ear and out the other. (laughs) Well, that's the preacher's lot often. He does all this work and the people don't do their work. It goes in one ear and out the other. You've got this Bible bullet going in one ear and out the other. Well, let's let's work at making sure that that doesn't happen here. Let, allow, make it the case that the Bible takes up residence in your heart. That you're the kind of Christian that's hospitable to the Word. Have those kind of services where God is worshipped as His Word is preached. And as His Word is preached and the Word is dwelling in hearts richly, you'll find that you will praise that which you enjoy.
and you will call others to enjoy it with you. Therefore, let us exalt his name together. Lord, we thank you for our time in the Word this morning. We thank you for these sacred times that we get to enjoy every Lord's Day where we meet in freedom to hear the Word of God preached and the gospel proclaimed. And it's life-changing. We, we, we come to revel in your grace and amazed at your love and can hardly take in all that you've yet to do in our lives. Lord, we gladly worship you. And so we pray as a congregation that we would forever be marked by expository preaching and expository listening. We're not here to worship the Bible. We're here to hear the Bible, that we might worship the God who's revealed in the Bible. We pray for a sweet work of your Spirit who will take his word and show us Christ and show us the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. We pray and ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. If you need to help our church.